Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, very interesting event. Before I'll describe what event the event is, I think we will uh, start with the uh, indigenous ceremony. Uh, Kath Krieger, the uh, elder, will will lead the ceremony. So after that, we will have a series of, of introductions. So, Kath. Thank you very much. So although I do have a microphone, I'm not going to stand in front of the actual podium and talk today. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is something very rare on this campus is I'm going to start a little fire. Um, hopefully a little fire. That's just, uh, I recognize because of the fire suppression systems and that I don't want to keep this going, but it, it's a smudge. It's a little bit of sage. It's, it's how we start our traditional gatherings. Normally we'd be all in a circle and it would go around to each and every person. And I actually invite anyone that wants to be part of a smudge ceremony afterwards. If you'd like to step outside, we can find a spot and we can actually do that. I always offer that. It is a moment to uh, cleanse our hands, our cells, our spirit, our body, our mind, our heart, our eyes, ears, nose, mouth, all those things. We take a bit of that smoke metaphorically and wash our hands and our cells in it. And it's a spiritual grounding so that we all come together with one mind. So that what we see today, we're going to look at with our hearts. When we uh, touch things, we'll touch them with our hearts. When we think about stuff, we're going to think about them with our hearts. The very air that we breathe in, we'll touch that with our hearts. Very importantly, we'll listen with our heart. Because words are our original method of communication. One of the earliest uh, ways of speaking. And when we combine those together with our actions, our body language, our, our way of being, and what we radiate as people. That light that shines from each and every one of us as we walk through life is supposed to bring life to everyone around us and warmth. We come together to share knowledge. I believe that's the point of this building. I think you can confirm that, right? <laughs> and uh, we come together to share knowledge. And that is sharing of a gift. And with all due respect to the ones who are knowledge carriers, wisdom carriers, the ones that gave up their entire life just to be here and teach us, that respect that is due them. So when we bring people in, we, we honor them in, in that way, and we, we walk them with open arms and open heart, and are uh, pleased that you'll share your gift with us so we have something to share in that way. This land that we walk on, I can acknowledge it as well. Most recently under the care of the Mississaugas and the new uh, credit, but when I talk to my friend Dave Smith in uh, anthropology, you know, we go back thousands of years in our discussions, you know, at least 13,000 years to the last ice age. Our people have walked this land since then. Many different tribes have walked the land, so we acknowledge all them and their ancestors, as well as your ancestors that walked a path that brought you here, the ones that put in place things that were your mentors, that you were teachers, the, the ones that you looked up to that allowed you a path through life that brought you here. And we gather all here today to share, and to, be share, to share our, our knowledge, to share our wisdom, to share our thoughts. So a lot of times when I'm in emails, I, I always write, I'll be pleased to come and share thoughts, because our thoughts are what we speak out loud. And it's hard to get all our thoughts out. It's hard to articulate all the things we want to say. And sometimes it's difficult to transfer that back and forth between people. But this is a place we do that. This is a place we come to that understanding. We still use pictures. We still use words. We still use action. And I believe we still use ceremony. When you come to this place, there is that ceremony that surrounds being here. That awe. Does everybody remember their first day in university? That awe with which you come here from high school and you're going, wow, this is really much bigger than high school. And it is, because this is the start of that transition in life, that time and space when you're looking at what is my path, what is my vision. So to help us along in our vision today, Cheryl's going to speak to us a little bit. She'll be introduced properly. Um, we had a wonderful conversation very briefly in my office today. Later on, I joined her. We went through some of the physics labs and a couple other places, and I actually got to play with a Tesla coil with a <laughs> keyboard. You missed it. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was awesome. Thank you. It was just that, that, that idea of, of, you know, in a sense, bringing the lightning out of the sky to speak in front of us and teach our, our young people a little bit more about what's happening around us. So today, let's enjoy what we have to say. Let's open our hearts, our ears, our eyes, all those things, and listen with our heart to what Cheryl has to say. I welcome you to our place. How many gretch? This event is the second uh, lectureship, E.A. Robinson Science Education Lectureship. We started last year with due to the generous gift of our former principal, Peter Robinson, that is here, and the, the really the tenacity of uh, our CPS faculty, Professor Judith Foley, uh, 
So um, it was great to, uh, to, to have this event last year and we, uh, we enjoyed um, the lecture last year. This year is, is a different topic, it's a very interesting topic, but I think um, if, I, if I reflect on, on what we do and why we do what we do in a science department, um, it's worthless. It's worthless if you do it in a, in a cave. Uh, Plato would not be proud of us. Um, <laughs> looking at the, at the, at the ghost on a, on, on a, on a cave wall and, and making sense of the world is probably a nice philosophical um, endeavor, but it's not how science is done now. So in order to, to be a true scientist, you need to be able to go out and explain what you do to the wider public. And that's, I think, the main purpose of this, of this lecture too. <coughs> To, uh, to share with the, the broader public, uh, the alumni, the, the students that may be inspired to go to a teaching career, why science is exciting. What, what do you get? You actually get so much more when you explain uh, complicated things to kids and to the public. So uh, I'd like to say a few words about Peter, Peter Robinson. So um, maybe the younger People in the audience might not know him, but uh, he was the second principal of UTM. He came to Canada almost 60 years ago, um, 1958. Um, started as a professor in chemistry in 1961. By the way, he's featured in the current issue of uh, M Magazine. Perfect timing for me to collect my, my numbers, the data, because uh, as you know, I, I'm keen on, on using numbers in what I, what, what I talked about. But um, Peter was was really forming a great team with John Pluto Wilson, the first, the first principal of, of UDM, he was the principal of UDM, and he was principal for two years from 1974 to 1976, and I was told that he was legendary for the parties he would uh, have in the, in the principal house here in the woods. So uh, I put it to the new principal, whoever that person might be, when we get to have a similar, to match that sort of uh, a party atmosphere. Because despite the fact that the 70s are not here anymore, I can guarantee you that people now, they still like to party. Um, and maybe talk about science. But uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you for coming every year to, uh, to, to this time of year, the convocation. You should see he has a legendary stamina, not probably because of those parties in the 70s. Uh, uh, later on today, he'll be part of a ceremony where uh, the, our brightest students will be uh, given awards for their performance. So year in and year out, Peter has been here, at least in time here for 11 years. I've seen him regularly every year. And um, I'm grateful for his gift to the department and the institution to allow us to bring uh, such uh, gifted speakers and very interesting uh, speakers to our series. Um, before I will pass on to um, John to introduce Dr. the speaker. Peter has asked me to allow him to say a few words. So, um, you don't need to, you can just turn around. I think people can see you. Turn around. Well, first of all, it's, it's extraordinarily nice to be here. And of course, my age, I know my 85th year, I can't be certain enough to use this text. Uh, I think you may see me again. You know. Uh, because I've done things with both this year. I thought at one stage I wouldn't come, here to come, but I twisted my ankle before Christmas, it took two months, so I could help to get out for help. So I'm a little bit careful now. Uh, also, I decided at the same time, because it, it was in fact the uh, 60th anniversary of a horrible uh, uh, about electric structure that most students would have heard about in the first year. The, the, the surveillance showed it in here in the Colton theory. It's actually uh, created by the person that I do my research with, Colin Gillespie and uh, Humphrey, uh, Ronald Snowden, both at my alma mater, which is the University of London. In fact, just a little sort of uh, thing that might interest you, but how the world has changed in the number of years I've been around. Um, when I've been at Berkeley College, an undergraduate in chemistry, the notion of research was up in the shelf somewhere and didn't really enter into the most undergraduate course. And uh, when I got into my last year of my BSc program, I was 
Secretary for Health one day to get a note from the Health Department Secretary uh, that he wanted to talk to me. This is the Department of American Health, Christopher Ingold, who told me he found some Kelly Kemp, who was the name Ingold, who was the early pioneer in reaction medicine, said that my name was Jesus. And uh, I wondered why he wanted to see me. Uh, it was straightforward. And I went in, they gave me their promise that I'd be telling you should do it. <laughs> and you should do your research with Dr. Robert Matthews. That's what I did by the time at all. Just as I was finishing my, my PhD, Ron came to my day and said, I've taken a job at six months at university, would you like to come and help me? Come and help start the new laboratory. You know, I got ten. <laughs> so I was three years at McMaster until um, 1961, and I happened at the time to be to be what was quite rare in those days, someone called a modern inorganic chemist. That was an inorganic chemist who would kind of discover the um, the new advantages with new ways of measuring molecular structure. Before that sort of time. Very few molecular structures were actually known in detail. Um, and um, in crystal for example, determining even the structure of diamonds might take three years. And it's also, by the way, so there's a so lady here. You can always imagine female effort and water. And some works and some are better than no. And it really was the time when NMR was being introduced. All kinds of uh, lasers had just been invented, but they hadn't quite been invented because I did start to get off to the laser. But uh, they were all coming on, and so it was a big resurgence of interest in compounds other than carbon compounds. So, of course, my definition of um, inorganic chemistry is it's a chemistry of all the elements, including each other. Not the most established carbon compounds, but you don't know. So that's sort of, sort of my history, and I've just been a sort of series of happy incidents. I joined the UFC three years after I joined the UFC. Um, the uh, vice president then, who was in charge of setting both started by the camp and during the process of the military, day, off the ground, um, Dr. Colin Williams, he said to me, um, he'd like you to be the first to be the first to be the first to be what you say? <laughs> I wonder, I wonder if he is why they chose me. They got there. You see, what he said, told us to tell him to be well. I think he's treating me so well. Sometimes I have to put punishment. Sometimes he's forced to write. But of course, they were lucky because what then happened is that we talked to William too much. He was probably a bit like 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 to think himself a bit. He was the president. Thank <laughs> you. 
And they were a wonderful couple. They really were. They were the most democratic people you could ever come from. It didn't matter who the member of the college was, if they bumped into the hall or on the ground, they always stopped to chat. And she knew everyone as an equal. She was a very nice. And um, so too, so uh, and, and we didn't, I didn't really want to be administrator. He wasn't too keen on the job, but of course he didn't. <laughs> Want to kind of make up some of the rules as we went along, yeah? But we had a, a, a fairly important way of doing things that work. When we had dean's meetings, for example, uh, the dean of the principal sit down and carry him discuss what was going on, what needed to be done immediately, and we decide that someone, someone was free to do it. We never wrote the memorandum to each other. It got done. So when you think about it, it's not a bad decision. And um, of course, we went to Ontario Township in those days, and there wasn't any staff. It was extremely rural, I think. I'm not sure what place it might be when the number, the number of heads of students counted more than the number of heads of cattle. It must have been quite late on in Canada. It was really a very isolated place, and we, we had a lot of fun. And very straightforward about things. Students uh, could come to committees on, on college council if they wanted to. Discovered, of course, was that the passengers in fact get on in the first place that once you're on, in fact, you don't come every time. So we were very democratic with the place and, uh, and happy and realized, in fact, that we had a very important role in the University of London's history because we knew in uh, 1967 the St. George campus had expanded quite rapidly in the 50s. And when you looked at the faculty profile, you realized straight away that there was going to be a bulge of associate professors and school professors, very few people coming up and giving up the And we thought our, one of our aims was to work as a part of a free campus university. And our job was to bring in the very brightest people we could in the department. And we did extremely well there. I can't talk about it all, but Jeffrey Oden, for example, is a father of an exceptional technology chemist, which finished in up chemist. I met the other day um, um, Martin Moskowitz, who I had here as a business professor, but for some reason, Martin didn't like him. We eventually became chairman downtown and did enormous good work. And in fact, he was chairman of the council and he was a person who was So it was even fun. I'm not sure I wanted to escape. I don't want to take off the I think really so you've heard the real history of Erin Local as I'll like it one day. More straightforward than you think. So with that introduction of the early days of Erindale College for the University of London and Saga, let's move on to uh, the topic of our today's lecture and now we'll invite Professor John Percy to introduce us. Seeing the 2007 uh, 2017 uh, Peter Robinson lecture, and that is uh, Professor Cheryl Bartlett from Cape Breton University uh, in Nova Scotia. So she is a biologist by background. She did her undergraduate work at University of Alberta, her doctorate at the University of Guelph, and after postdoctoral research in France and at the University of Guelph, she took up a faculty position at uh, Cape Breton University in biology in, eight, in 1989. Uh, she was promoted to full professor in 1997. Uh, her specialty in biology was in wildlife parasitology and disease, and uh, that's an area in which she had published widely. But uh, she's here because of another part of her background, and that is the initiative that she brought uh, in the 1990s, uh, namely um, in, in partnership with the Mi'kmaq First Nation uh, the development of the globally unique concept of integrative science and two-eyed seeing. And she served as director of the Institute for Integrative Science and Health at Cape Breton University and received numerous grants for the support of that institute. So I first became acquainted with Cheryl in 2009, which was International Year of Astronomy. It was a 148 country celebration of Galileo's development and use of the astronomical telescope. 
And Cheryl was on the organizing committee, and in that capacity, she led our efforts to establish effective and respectful partnerships with the First Nations of Canada and to help to preserve Indigenous knowledge and to preserve dark skies for both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities, and also to illuminate pathways for young people, for Aboriginal youth, uh, to develop interests and careers in science. She's been much honoured for this work for the Canada Research Chair in 2002 by appointment to the Order of Canada in 2011. Her work was highlighted in the recent Naylor Report on science research in Canada, and I think that's perhaps an indication that the ideas that she's developed uh, are of particular interest to uh, our new federal government. Now, sadly, the Integrative Science Program was closed down by her university, and undoubtedly she'll tell us a bit about that. But I think it's very important for her work to be kept alive, particularly in this Canada 150 year uh, when Aboriginal culture and Aboriginal education are on our mind, or at least should be. And indeed, the concepts from Aboriginal, uh, for, from integrative science and the tools and the methods that Cheryl's developed for her classroom carry over to the general challenge of how do we best educate our diverse population. So Cheryl continues to uh, crisscross the country, speaking to groups like this, uh, to keep her uh, wisdom and uh, expertise and experience in the eyes of the younger generation. I know that's her specific goal today, is to interest those who are younger and uh, are able to uh, continue the important work that she's doing. So please join me in welcoming Cheryl Bartlett to speak on We Together, Integrative Science and 2IC. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Jillian. Thank you, Michelle. Where are you, Michelle? Thank you, Michelle. You've done a wonderful job of taking care of me. And thank you, University of Toronto, Mississauga, for inviting me to come here. And thank you to the Indigenous peoples of this land upon whose feet I'm standing, who have been here for thousands of years before I stood here, and who are here today, and the Indigenous peoples whose territories are coast to coast to coast in this land that we call Canada, these indigenous nations that were here thousands of years before this country called Canada came into existence. So with great gratitude, I say thank you. What I would like to tell you today is a story, and that is what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada is asking us also to do, is to listen to the stories of people who have experienced the trauma that our country, Canada, has inflicted upon them, and these stories are often the stories of stolen land and broken promises and cultural genocide, and an educational system that did not recognize that they had been here for thousands and thousands of years. And we have a responsibility to the relationships of those stories to listen to them, to learn from them, and we have a responsibility to the relationships called reconciliation to try and act in constructive ways that can heal the relationships. So the story that I would like to share with you today is a story. It's a story of many relationships. It's a story that for me personally, has many delightful and heartwarming moments, and it's a story that for me personally has many heartbreaking and painful moments. That's what a story is about. There's actually three of us giving this story today. Two of the other people cannot be here with me physically, but I can assure you they are here with me spiritually, and they assured me of that. Elder Albert Marshall and Elder Merdina Marshall are the two elders from the community of Eskasoni in Unamagi, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, in the Mi'kmaq Nation. 
the two elders with whom I have worked most closely for almost 25 years. I personally grew up in southern Alberta. I am of newcomer lineage or settler lineage. That part of Alberta that I grew up in is traditional Blackfoot territory. And it is a great honor and privilege for me to be working in the traditional territories of the Mi'kmaq people in Atlantic Canada now. Elder Albert Marshall is from the Moose Clan, and Elder Merdina Marshall is from the Bear Clan. Elder Albert and I are still doing lots of telling of the stories from coast to coast to coast in Canada, and it's going on 25 years. Elder Merdina joined us for many years, but she is now, because of health problems, restricted to home. But she is very much a participant in this story. So Mi'kma'ki, the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq Nation. This is where our story of We Together starts. Starts in Mi'kma'ki. The story has one major theme, bringing together Indigenous and Western scientific knowledges. So the story of We Together has one major theme, and that is bringing together Indigenous and Western scientific knowledges. And it's got two subparts. The first, integrative science, which is a post-secondary science education program, although I should speak of it in the past tense, because as John told you, it, it has been shut down. And the second subpart is called two-eyed seeing, which is a guiding principle. And they kind of chase each other. And I think you'll see what I mean as I go on. It's a good story, although as I said, it's got its ups and downs, its pain and heartbreak, as well as its delight and heartwarming moments. But most of all, it has involved many, many people, many valued participants. So when I begin my presentation, what I would like to do is thank those participants. Then I want to briefly talk about educational change that brought us to the point of creating the Integrative Science Program. I want to introduce the Integrative Science Program briefly, along with two-eyed seeing. Then I want to mention two national documents. Then I want to come back to Integrative Science and look at various components within that. And then I want to do a conclusion. And as my friend Jillian knows, <laughs> 160 slides later, you're going to be wondering, whoo, <laughs> what, what, what hit us? And as John is going to remind me after 20 minutes and then 40 minutes that I better hurry up. <laughs> All right. So much of this presentation is going to be like skipping stones. You know, when you were a kid and you took a stone and you chucked it at a body of water and it goes skip, skip, skip across the surface. And it doesn't sink down until it runs out of energy at the end. Well, that's the way this presentation is going to be. We're not really going to sink down. We're just going to skip and skip. And I'm going to introduce and mention various things. So first of all, I would like to say thank you, Chi Miigwech. We'll all in thank you to various funding agencies and the partners who all played a role in this story. And those partners range from the elementary school in the First Nation of Member 2, which is close to Sydney in Unamagi, Cape Breton, to uh, the Mermaid Theater, a puppetry organization in Nova Scotia, to NSERC, CIHR, SHRC, the Canada Research Chairs, the university, and many, many people. I want to particularly thank the Mi'kmaq elders and the members of my Canada research team. The Mi'kmaq elders across Nova Scotia and across uh, the traditional territory of Mi'kma'ki, which stretches through Atlantic Canada, and organizations from those communities. I want to thank the land, Unamagi, in the Mi'kmaq language means land of the fog. I want to thank Maui Sugamugawe, the nurturing wholeness, or as we often say in the English language, Mother Earth. I want to thank indigenous knowledge holders and elders across Canada. Uh, El Elder Albert Marshall and Merdina and myself have interacted with many, many, many across Canada, coast to coast to coast. I want to thank the Western science knowledge holders and elders who have been very, very good to me. And uh, John mentioned already the International Year of Astronomy 2009. 
and I have some special relationships with the elders in Western science as a result of that, and I wish to say thank you there also. The integrative science students at CBU who taught me lots, and I think I taught them a little. Uh, young people in Unamagi, Cape Breton, who went on some magnificent field trips with us. Younger people who uh, go to summer science camps and uh, have the great delight of trying to learn astronomy by acting it out on a picnic table. <laughs> uh, artists and poets, colleagues across Canada. I wish I had time to name them all. There's lots. The only one who's here physically with me today is Jillian. Jillian, thank you. But they all gave their support for this presentation. So I really like to thank my colleagues. So back to Mi'kma'ki 25 years ago. The early 1990s. Merdina is saying this. So this is Merdina speaking. Boy, Cheryl, look, wake up. We Mi'kma people have been here in Mi'kma'ki our traditional territory, for thousands and thousands of years. And we have rich knowledge about the land, the plants, the fishes, the birds, the other animals, the medicines, and the waters, and the skies. Aren't those the sorts of things that you teach in biology, in science? So why isn't our Mi'kmaq knowledge included in science, or that of other indigenous peoples across Canada? Because if you could include our indigenous knowledges in post-secondary science, then science would likely be more attractive for our young people, our young indigenous students, and they would probably choose to study it rather than avoid it, as they all too often tend to do. That's Elder Merdina speaking way back in the early 1990s. All right. Now let's jump to today, 2017. Change is occurring in the educational uh, levels, in the educational systems across Canada. Indigenous knowledges and ways of knowing are now being included in science in the kindergarten to grade six levels in some places, fueled by the determined efforts of indigenous peoples, educators, scholars, and individuals like myself who are trying to help them, allies. Here is one of the great delights of the Integrative Science Program is Carolyn Knockwood, who is now working as a, a, a Master's of Education student to develop new elementary curricula with Mi'kmaq elders that will be taught in the elementary schools that are band-operated schools in Nova Scotia. Just an absolute delight. I wish I had hours to talk about that. But this is what Merdina's dream was. Could we have science at the university level that included Mi'kmaq traditional knowledge, that included the indigenous knowledges of people across Canada? Could we do that at the post-secondary level? That was Merdina's long-held dream. So one answer at the post-secondary educational level is integrative science. And it, it existed at Cape Breton University from 1999 to about 2010. And I worked very, very closely with Elder Merdina, who was on staff, faculty member in Mi'kmaq Studies, to create that program. Just a couple of other examples. University of Lethbridge, my colleague Michelle Hogue, is trying very hard to create a two-eyed seeing or integrative science type program at the University of Lethbridge. At Trent University, there's also the Indigenous Environmental Studies and Sciences with Dr. Dan Longboat and his students working very, very hard. So the landscape for education is changing across Canada, and I'm very happy to say that Integrative Science was one of the early pioneers in trying to do this. There are others who are really, with great determination, trying to do similar things. So the short story about integrative science, the Mi'kmaq word for the program, means bringing our knowledges together. 
new science program at Cape Breton University, a four-year degree program in what was called a Bachelor of Science Community Studies degree. Why make science education more attractive to the Mi'kmaq First Nations students in that area by bringing Mi'kmaq traditional knowledge and mainstream or Western science together? As I said, 1999 to 2010, what was the overall result? Many, many more Mi'kmaq students in science. The long story, you've got to hold on, because it's coming. <laughs> what about two-eyed seeing? What is it? It's the guiding principle for integrative science. It was a concept that Elder Albert Marshall brought forward. He offered it as a guiding principle for integrative science. And as the years rolled on, we came to realize that it was also similarly an excellent guiding principle for other collaborations that were trying to bring Western scientific knowledge and indigenous knowledges together, or simply other intercultural endeavors. In Mi'kmaq, two-eyed seeing is adoptimal. And when Elder Albert brought this concept forward, he reached into his understandings as a fluent speaker of the Mi'kmaq language and said, there is a concept in our traditional knowledge that says, in any given situation, you're a lot better off if you can bring at least two perspectives to bear than just one perspective. And it's called Edwaptamunk, the gift of multiple perspectives. So in Elder Albert's own words, two-eyed seeing is learn to see with your one eye from the best or the strengths in the indigenous ways of knowing and knowledges. And from your other eye, learn to see with the strengths or the best in the Western science ways of knowing or knowledges. But most importantly of all, learn to see with both those eyes together. Those are Elder Albert's words. And if Elder Albert were standing here and would have just said that, he would then look at me and I would say, yeah, and learn to use those eyes the way it was intended. This eye sees good, this eye sees good, they see very good together, in fact, they see better together, and they weren't meant to work in a cross-eyed way. They were meant to support each other. All right, so I think it's a very, very powerful guiding principle that Elder Albert brought forward. The icon that he encouraged our, our graphic designer within the integrative science team to create for him was two eyes behind two pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. And what he means with that icon is that there's at least two pieces. Notice they don't fit well together. But there's other options for other cultures to come into this two-eyed seeing. So we could talk about four-eyed seeing or 10-eyed seeing or 100-eyed seeing. We could also switch the perspective slightly and say, OK, the traditional knowledges, the indigenous knowledges are collective. One individual only holds one piece. Another individual holds another piece. Another individual holds another piece. We have to come together in a collective way. Those of us who work in the sciences realize that, you know, if you know just a little bit about teeny weeny little worms that live in birds, <laughs> you need all those other pieces to be even just a biologist, right? So I think it's a very, very powerful icon that Elder Albert suggested. One eye, obviously, the indigenous, the other eye, the western. I've started putting a happy face behind it because <clears throat> I want to remind people that it's a guiding principle. It's meant to speak to our minds, our souls, our hearts, our spirits. It's not a mechanism. It's us. It's me as a two-legged human being, working with Kat as a two-legged human being. It's us working together. And that requires ongoing commitment to relationships, and it requires personal understanding of positionality and acting upon responsibilities to reciprocities and accountabilities. And my friend Jillian keeps encouraging me, Cheryl, Really, we have to keep saying this. It's so important to live up to our responsibilities to relationships. We can't just do things in a superficial way. So I said, OK, Jillian, <laughs> I will acknowledge what you're, you're teaching me. Because the downside to two-eyed seeing is that some people have just said, oh, OK, I'm going to co-opt it or trivialize it, or as Elder Albert says, romanticize it. And they're just doing the easy thing. I read an article. I read a book. 
Now I know enough, I can do, in quotes, two-eyed seeing. That's not what it was intended to be. We have to live up to our relationships, our responsibilities, our commitments, our accountabilities. All right, so to preclude the downside, we, Elder Albert and I, have started talking in the last few years about four key essentials for two-eyed seeing, realizing that each of those brings profoundly challenging questions. They don't sound too difficult. Uh, one, two, three, four, co-learning, knowledge scrutinization, knowledge validation, knowledge gardening, or if you want to, learning together to see the best by peers walking our talk. I'm only going to briefly talk about co-learning because I could talk about it for hours, and I'm only gonna somewhat less briefly talk about knowledge gardening because I could talk about it for days, so I'm gonna skip the other two, unfortunately. So let's go to co-learning. Why do we need to do co-learning? Well, as has been mentioned, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and its 94 calls to action, all framed with the understanding of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which Canada has finally adopted. So profoundly challenging questions for just co-learning itself. How do we move to working collectively rather than as individuals? And these questions are Elder Albert's questions. How do we get our spirits to start collaborating? How do we invoke the spirit of co-learning at universities? Profoundly challenging questions. And Jillian's voice, we must also consider colonialism, racism, unequal power dynamics, and I really am grateful to Jillian, who's a PhD student in the Indigenous Studies uh, program at Trent for continually reminding me of, of all the other things that go with what we're trying to do. So to knowledge gardening, why would we want to do knowledge gardening? Because we need to grow our understandings. If we talk about planting seeds, and it's interesting in all the conversations I've had over the course of today, how many of you have said to me, Cheryl, we're planting seeds. All right, if we're planting seeds, then what we're doing is knowledge gardening, <laughs> right? So we need to be able to walk our talk, not just talk our talk, and we need to do this in relationship with communities, with their interests and their needs, following their protocols, right? So knowledge gardening. How do we create opportunities to grow together and help each other? Again, that's Elder Elbert's question. Well, education and research are excellent arenas in which to do knowledge gardening. So, an example of knowledge gardening is integrative science. It's a retrospective example because we didn't really realize that at the time, but it emerged in the educational arena. It was growing in the research arena thanks to the Canada Research Chairs Program. It was something that Elder Merdina and I worked on together, so our paths crossed. We were both on faculty. Merdina is a fluent speaker of the Mi'kmaq language. She's a spiritual leader for the nation granddaughter of the Grand Chief. And I was a biologist and educator on faculty at CBU, Tier 1 Canada Research Chair. We were working together. So after 25 years of working together, and that's a picture of us in 2010 in southern Alberta at Blackfoot Crossing, and that's my mother standing there beside me, I'm really, really pleased to say that we have grown and explained and promoted integrative science and two-eyed seeing such that they are now found in two key national documents, and two-eyed seeing has also been put to work as, as a guiding principle in project after project after project across Canada. So the first key national document that I wish to mention was only released a couple months ago, not even a couple months ago, just April. It was the report by the expert panel, Canada's Fundamental Science Review, called Investing in Canada's Future, Strengthening the Foundations of Canadian Research. The person who chaired it should be a familiar name to University of Toronto people because it was Dr. David Naylor. He was the chair of the expert panel. And he says, this report, if it's implemented, could change Canadian research capacity and have long-term impacts across the nation. And on page 99, 
are highlighted, both integrative science and two-eyed seeing. I didn't know this was coming, and it was Shirk who got hold of me and said, Cheryl, read this. <laughs> and I thought, ooh, wow. I really am grateful to Dr. David Naylor and his fellow uh, panelists who recognized that we're trying to change the landscape for education and research in Canada. And I'm really grateful to Judith, who helped me change my understandings around a few key things this morning. Thanks, Judith. The second key document was released in February of 2016, and it's the Strategic Plan for the Institute of Aboriginal People's Health within CIHR. That strategic plan was 2014 to 2018. You might ask, why was it only released two years after it was supposed to be? Well, there was a change in government, right? Remember? <laughs> the person who was the scientific director for the Institute of Aboriginal People's Health and who adopted two-eyed seeing and embedded it in their strategic plan is Dr. Malcolm King, who is a member of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, right here in this, this territory, right? So they embedded two-eyed seeing in their strategic plan. Page 26 talks about how it's part of strategic direction number two. I'm really, really happy about that. So promising ways forward to find two-eyed seeing and integrative science in both of those key national documents. Back to integrative science. OK, so John, how's my time? You're OK. I'm OK. <laughs> Merdina and I were both on faculty in the late 1980s through to the late 1990s. Make a very, very long story short, I say to Merdina one day, Merdina, why are there no Mi'kmaq students in the biology program? I teach first year biology, I teach fourth year biology. There's no Mi'kmaq students in my biology program. There's lots of Mi'kmaq students here at the university. They're in arts, they're in business, they're in community studies. Why aren't they in science? And Merdina, with her wisdom and excellent sense of humor, says, Cheryl, enrich how you teach science. Then more Mi'kmaq students would probably choose to study science. So in other words, change the way you teach it. And I wish I had time to tell more Merdina stories because she has such a wonderful sense of humor, as I said, and her insights are profound. So what kind of a view of science are we going to use if we're going to say this is a science program, a four-year degree science program, bringing together the indigenous knowledges with the Western science knowledges, and it's the natural sciences we're talking about, kind of a view of science. Well, here was our premise, that acquisition of scientific knowledge is essential to human survival. It's a practical engagement with the real world, and the scientific pursuit of knowledge must, therefore, be as old as the consciousness of our human species. In other words, it's not something that just popped up in Europe some centuries ago. In other words, every culture has science. That's our premise. Integrative science emphasizes the natural world and our human participation within it cultural inclusivity, and our roles, including our responsibilities as knowledge agents or as storytellers for our knowledge systems. Those are the three things that we tried to emphasize. This visual was done by one of our artists. I simply said, please, could you create us something that speaks a thousand words in one powerful image? Bringing our knowledges together, indigenous and Western. All right, the simple, very useful Venn diagram that recognizes common ground and differences right within the image itself. What we wanted to emphasize was there is common ground. There are lots of differences. We're going to recognize and respect and we are not going to try and merge or blend. And that's quite a discussion that's going on now, I realize, in Canada with respect to people who are doing related work. Is are we going to merge, are we going to blend, or are we not? 
Let's go back to the two-eyed seeing principle. The one eye works really well on its own. It's a knowledge system in its own right. The other eye works very well on its own. It's a knowledge system in its own right. But they work better when they work together. Right? So a whole eye, a complete knowledge system. A whole eye, a complete knowledge system. We want to recognize that the Western sciences and the indigenous knowledges are knowledge systems. But we want to bring them into relationship. And in doing that, we want to recognize that there is common ground and there's a richness of difference. That was our approach. And if you look at the word integrative science, it has an I-V-E ending, which indicates that it's work that is forever active and ongoing. It's not an integrated science program, which would mean it's done. It's complete. It's finished. Integrative brings a different meaning. It means the action is ongoing. So we are bringing our knowledges together ongoing, trying to have them work as one. As Elder Elbert says, this work is not easy. <laughs> it took four years of internal and external inquisition for our new science program to be fully approved by the Maritime Provinces Higher Education Commission. And in April 2001, we had a party. We heard about parties earlier. They're important. <laughs> we had a party. <laughs> we celebrated. <laughs> right. Very quickly, the program structure for that new science degree, called the Bachelor of Science Community Studies, the degree was already in existence. It was the program of integrative science that was new and had four years of inquisition. <laughs> four parts to the degree program structure, a core, a concentration, electives, and work placements. Integrative science was the concentration within that degree profile. The students in that had to take regular science courses in chemistry, regular science courses in math or physics, and regular courses in environmental or public health. They had to take those. On top of that, they had to take what we called these brand new science courses called MSIT courses, which is a Mi'kmaq word that essentially means everything except the kitchen sink. All right, so we're going to bring everything together. And the students had to take four full years of those MSIT courses within the degrees, overall 20 uh, full year courses. So when I say that there was a four year inquisition over whether this could be approved or not, it was around those four courses because the degree profile itself was already in existence. There were other concentrations. It was all about those four courses. But finally, the Maritime Provinces Higher Education Commission said yes. And I think they finally just gave up because we weren't <laughs> giving up. <laughs> so I'm happy to share with you how we tried to shape and the Evolve curricula, and several people were involved. Uh, so when I share this information with you, it's with respect to the first year courses. There were two full year courses required at the first year level. One of those courses was uh, called Sense of Place, Emergence, and Participation. And the other was called Ways of Knowing. Those were Merdina's labels for the courses. And then Merdina sat down and sketched the Mi'kmaq content that she wanted to see in those courses. And I sat with her for many hours at the kitchen table in her home. And I said, with respect to the science content, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Until we came up with what we considered to be appropriate complementary science material. Right? But we were reaching into biology, geology, chemistry, physics. <laughs> We also had lots of input from talking circles with community members, lots of conversations around coffee and tea at people's kitchen tables, uh, elders and educators, leaders of organizations. We had some experts from away come and give their ideas. We had lots of friends who had lots of ideas. And of course, there was some literature. But back in the early 90s, when we were doing this, early to mid 90s, the literature was not the mountain ranges that you now have. So it was a little easier to start uh, getting involved, because now there's mountain range upon mountain range upon mountain range of literature. 
Key advice that we received was learn with and from the land, from Maui Sigamugawe. Learn about the nurturing wholeness. Another key request was include, embed, make it compulsory, the Mi'kmaq language. Dr. Gregory Cajete, who is a native scientist from New Mexico, director of native studies at the university, came and visited with us in Unamagi, Cape Breton. Indeed, he's a good friend of Merdina's and Albert's. And he said, Cheryl, you know, the most difficult thing that you're going to have is to reawaken the student's sense of creativity. You're going to need it for that science program. You've got to work on it, and it's going to be your greatest challenge. Reawaken the sense of creativity. And he said something else that I have never forgotten. He said, just be courageous. Get going. Teach yourselves how. Have faith that you're going to do something. <laughs> because if you sit around in analysis paralysis forever, you won't get going. Just get going. And you're going to make mistakes. But learn from them. All right? So with that kind of, all right. <laughs> Reaching into some of the literature, uh, Dr. Marie Batiste, uh, this is a document from 2002, although we were going, this, this program itself started in the mid or late 90s and we were putting things together in the mid 90s. But she said, focusing on the similarities between the knowledge systems rather than their differences is probably the best place to start, right? So that was some advice from her. Elder Merdina. A genius, an educator, and everything else said, Cheryl, we Mi'kmaq people are visual thinkers. So to the best of your abilities, do everything in a very visual way, which is why over the years I've learned how to give slide presentations with 160 slides, because it's got to be visual. Merdina said, here's a model, a visual model of Mi'kmaq knowledge. It's four concentric circles. The outermost circle is labeled physical knowledge. And if we were talking about medicine, it would be the physical knowledge of the medicine. The next circle is the personal connection to that medicine. The next circle in is respect for the medicine. And then the innermost is the sacred nature of the medicine. And that innermost knowledge, the sacred nature, can only be expressed in the Mi'kmaq language and should never, ever be translated into another language. Right? And Merdina said, the physical knowledge of the medicine is something that's shared with Western science. No problem at all. We can share. You can work with students to develop personal connections. You can work with students to develop respect. And we can work with students so that they see in their own language the sacred nature. So if we take Merdina's model and we just fancy it up a little bit so that we can have a comparison with Western science. Here is an excellent visual that has helped me explain our science program to many, many audiences. I went through the, the labels for the four concentric circles in Merdina's model. If we look at the Western science or the mainstream science, yes, we've got physical knowledge. That's what we talk about, physical knowledge. Yes, we have a language that's not considered a sacred language, but it's a language of mathematics. <laughs> what we would like to think that we leave out in Western science when we tell our science stories, when we publish them in peer-reviewed journals, is that I've left myself out of the story. But anybody who does discovery science knows that's a fib. <laughs> but then when we come to give our scientific publications and write them, we write them with that fib. <laughs> I remember an editor of a journal telling me I couldn't even acknowledge my mother, whose kitchen table I used to do bird dissections, I couldn't even acknowledge her in the acknowledgments of my scientific paper because that kind of information doesn't belong in a science paper. <laughs> so, it's kind of a, a strange approach. So it's a very useful uh, model because it says a zillion things. Now, what else does it say? Notice where the storytellers are standing. The storyteller for the Mi'kmaq traditional knowledge, for indigenous knowledges, is part of the knowledge system. And the storyteller for the Western sciences tries to detach or disconnect themselves from the story they're telling. So they're standing in different places. 
Notice that language is at the core. How many times as a young person did I hear, if you want to do science, Cheryl, you've got to learn math. If you can't do math, you can't do science. That's because math is the language of science. Right? Notice at the center of Merdina's model for Mi'kmaq traditional knowledge, the language. The language is important. Every single knowledge holder and every single elder across this country will tell you the language, the language, the language is important. <clears throat> uh, Elder Elbert says, okay, we humans are storytellers and the foundational basis for any relationship is an exchange of stories. Think about your first date you went out on. What did you do to develop a relationship? You swapped and shared stories, right? That's what it's all about, exchange of stories. As storytellers, we have responsibilities to our knowledges, and over on the one side are words that every science person in this room would recognize immediately. Those are my responsibilities to the way I create my science stories. And over on the left-hand side are the responsibilities that every knowledge holder, every elder would say are part of the indigenous knowledges. We have responsibilities as storytellers. Okay, we can fancy up those responsibilities and we can say you have to know something about epistemology, ontology, methodology, and axiology. I can assure you that doesn't go over well at the first year level. <laughs> I don't think it goes over well at any level really with science students. So we tried to take those fancy words and put them into visuals. And you see the one that uh, was on the previous slide. Well, we tried to do the same thing for the other concepts. So here's the word version, and I didn't put the visuals up, but we developed pictures that tried to say the same thing. And then El Elder Elbert, who sat down with this book, Researches Ceremony, he loves to read. He said, Cheryl, those fancy words, I know, I know they're fancy words, but you know something? In my Mi'kmaq language, we've got those same concepts, and there they are. So his thoughts in English, and then he's translated them, or he's not translated them, he's thought them through in Mi'kmaq, and there they are. But I can assure you again, it doesn't go over well with students if you start talking about ontology, epistemology, et cetera. And I'm not a philosopher, so I probably don't do a very good job of explaining it anyhow. So we took students out of doors. We made Maui Sugamuga Way part of our learning. Merdina came in and gave the odd guest lecture. At this time, she was on long-term disability, unfortunately, and wasn't able to teach in the program on a regular basis, but she came in and gave guest lectures. We had other elders come in and tell their stories and work with the students and do ceremony. Yes, we used microscopes. <laughs> we did that sort of work. Students did projects, and we had a linguist who was working on Mi'kmaq language with the students. Most of the students did not speak their own language. So the level of linguistics was right at the very basic level. What I was really trying to work on as a Canada Research Chair was to develop science as pattern stories. So if we acknowledge that science is a pattern-based way of understanding the world, and it's common ground, is it common ground? If we use this view, science is dynamic, pattern-based knowledge shared through stories about our interactions with and within nature, then we better have some pattern recognition as a common ground in our knowledge system. So I spoke to my artist friend, Gerald Glode, who is the person who designed the 2017 nickel for Canada. It's got a beaver on it. Mm -hmm. He used to work for the Department of Natural Resources in Nova Scotia. He's a speaker of the Mi'kmaq language. He's from Millbrook First Nation. He did the artwork for one of the storybooks we did with the elders. And he said, Cheryl, pattern recognition is a basic skill within Mi'kmaq traditional knowledge. There was an initiative ongoing in Alaska in the early 2000s that we didn't catch up with in terms of awareness until much later and they have pattern recognition as common ground between indigenous and western sciences. And they had millions of dollars to do this from the National Science Foundation in the States. So we were really happy about that. And of course, pattern recognition, math is the language of pattern recognition, right? So yeah, we've got pattern recognition in our knowledge systems. It's common ground if there's differences. So if we're going to teach science from uh, a strength using pattern knowledge, 
remembering that Dr. Gregory Cajete said, reawaken the student's sense of creativity. What we worked a lot on was pattern sensitivity, pattern recognition, pattern transformation, pattern communication. All right, so we have to recognize that humans have lots of pattern smarts and we can sanction many of those when we tell our stories or we can sanction very few of them. In other words, give permission to use. We can reach into some of the literature and say, okay, the holistic lifelong learning model for First Nations that was developed from the Canadian Council of Knowledge, uh, Canadian Council of Learning, the Aboriginal Learning Knowledge Centre, recognizes all sorts of domains and sources of pattern knowledge. We can look to Howard Gardner's multiple intelligences theory, which recognizes eight so-called intelligences or, or smarts, pattern smarts, and maybe he said there's an, a ninth one that he called existential, eh, maybe he called it spirit, all right? He was a little reluctant to use that word. You can understand why. It's a brain-based theory. But there's just an example. Humans have lots of pattern smarts, and we can use many of them, or we can use few of them. Here's what Western science does in terms of what it sanctions. Not in terms of what it uses for discovery science and not in terms of what we might do for educational purposes. But when we tell our stories as scientists, those are the only smarts we're allowed to acknowledge. Interesting, eh? In fact, there is this quote, Western science is distinguished from other pursuits by the precise and limited intellectual means that it employs and the integrity with which it uses its limited means. <clears throat> and that was Jane Jacobs in a book in 2004. And then she went on to say it uses the most amazing array of instrumentation and equipment. And this afternoon I had a tour of the labs here, the chemistry lab and the physics lab. And indeed, University of Toronto, Mississauga, you have created for your students in science the most amazing array of instrumentation and equipment to complement, to strengthen that. Yeah. So when we tell our stories, we're telling stories of matter and energy, and uh, the interesting thing is I think we don't do a very good job of telling the stories with energy included. All right, so if you recognize a so-called staircase to the uni universe, which we're at the very bottom of the staircase, we have the tiniest particles of matter, and you work your way all the way up to the universe itself. We recognize those different levels of organization. That is the pattern upon which the whole of Western science is based. It's a simplistic pattern, and you can say, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, in all sorts of ways. But I can assure you that working with students, and it doesn't matter whether it was in the integrative science program or whether it was in the biology program at first year uh, courses or fourth year courses, that staircase pattern, if they don't know it, they are lost. They are lost. It is the the organizational structure that they have to understand. And of course, it comes loaded with lots of terminology. I wish that we talked, as I said, more about the energy forces, the four fundamental energy forces that we recognize, but we don't tend to do that too much, at least in biology. And I asked in some of my conversations this morning, do you teach quantum physics to biology students here at UTM? And I got some interesting answers. One of the most common patterns that we encounter as science students is the periodic table of elements. It's a pattern. And you can teach that all on the basis of what patterns are there, what patterns change as you go across the rows, what patterns change as you go down. And I have long shared with many of my colleagues that my ideal way of teaching the periodic table of the elements would be able to dance it, use body language, body smarts. And I have been surprised at how many of my colleagues have said, yeah, I thought of that too, but I've never been brave enough to try it with my students. <laughs> I got 10 minutes left, okay. In Western science, spirit does not exist and consciousness is still problematic. Hmm? So my world is many objects, okay, and energy fields too. <laughs> But I'm not in the story except if I'm in quantum physics. And that's why I keep asking people, as I did this morning, what about quantum physics? Because some of the most interesting conversations in the early 90s between native scientists and Western scientists were all around language and quantum physics. Yeah. 
but I can assure you that doesn't work in the classroom because <laughs> I'm not a quantum physics person. I can't do it with passion. Right? My own research in the staircase pattern is I worked with worms, mainly in birds, so I was working at the organismal level. And then bringing in a, a lot of technical uh, words for the different concepts that wildlife disease or human disease brings into play. But it's really interesting because each of these technical words has a specific place in that staircase. And if you start mixing them up, a specialist will look at you cross-eyed, <laughs> probably crossly. <laughs> we tell our stories, we, we take the patterns apart, then we reassemble them and we, we put those assemblages, the, those stories into explanatory professional publications such as parasitic diseases of wild birds. That's what I was doing as a parasitologist. That's my background, but I'm not in the story. <laughs> when we sanction lots of these pattern smarts, we get an entirely different type of science. It's a holistic science. I'm in the story. Spirit is everywhere. Place, emergence, and participation, the stories themselves are alive. This is indigenous science, and that's what Merdina really, really wanted us to understand when she gave the courses that title, Sense of Place, Emergence, and Participation, so that a young person out participating in a community moose harvest, learning from elders, learning from other community members, learning from the moose, thanking the moose. This is a holistic science story from the Mi'kmaq perspective. When we look at the night sky, it's alive. It's a sense of place, emergence, and participation. Here we have a bear and seven bird hunters making a full meta pattern around the North Star Dadaban over the course of one year. This is the work that I am so grateful to have done with the elders from both Western science and the Mi'kmaq knowledge during the International Year of Astronomy because it gave us the most perfect pattern story that you could imagine. Astronomy is such a powerful way of teaching integrative science. Uh, it truly, truly is. This story is called Muin, the, the bear is Muin in the Mi'kmaq language and the seven bird hunters. It's an oral calendar. Elder Lillian Marshall from Bodoladek First Nation in Unamagi, Cape Breton had been trying for years to revive this story. And so when we came along in 2007, 2008 as preparation for the International Year of Astronomy in 2009, Elder Lillian was so, yes, let's do this together. We then had a meeting of elders from around Unamagi, Cape Breton and we received the endorsement from the Council of Elders to go ahead. Merdina joined our efforts and some very dedicated young people from my integrative science team became involved. The artist Gerald Glode, remember the guy who's designed our 2017 nickel with the beaver on it, did some powerful artwork for us that shows that the patterns in the stars and the patterns on Earth are reflections one of the other from the Mi'kmaq perspective. such that they reflect one another. And, and in the story of Muin, the bear, and the seven bird hunters, you are told how the reflections change over the year, over one full year. And I wish I had time to go into that, but I don't, just believe me. Over the course of one 24-hour period, day or night, Muin and the seven birds, of course, because the earth turns on her axis, one full revolution. It appears as if the stars are making one full revolution over the course. So days, which then turn into moons or months. And we did some uh, artwork around creating symbols for the Mi'kmaq names for the months. The months into seasons, the seasons into years, and then we did a huge poster, which is about the size of what you see on the screen there. The years into generations, the generations into all my relations and Maui Sugumugawe. And Elder Lillian said that poster is a whole science curriculum for grade one to 12 for a Mi'kmaq school because all the relations and all the stories can be brought into it. 
so they were very, very happy. What I'm going to focus on only is the season, the fall season when the bear gets shot by the hunter, the robin, gets killed, the bear's spirit leaves her, the bear's blood is all over the fur, robin is starving to death, so robin jumps on the bear, gets smeared with blood all over his feathers, and shakes himself, and when he shakes himself, the blood goes all over the trees and the leaves turn red, hmm? which in that poster is over there in the fall season, and that's why red is the sacred color in that uh, location when you have the patterns within the patterns within the patterns, according to Moon and the Seven Bird Hunters, all right? The elders knew when we did the Moon poster that 12 moons is not the proper natural pattern. Actually, there's 12 moons in a bit in every solar year. But they said, Cheryl, we think that that understanding has been lost. And so let's do what follows the calendar that the kids see on the wall. And let's just make a small note at the bottom of the poster that there is a 13th moon, the understandings for which need to be revived, but probably lost. A friend, a colleague, Dave Chapman, has worked with a Mi'kmaq uh, woman, uh, uh, Kathy LeBlanc, and they have written an article that shows a possible way that you could revive some understandings around that. So we knew there wasn't a good match there. That Mi'kmaq night sky story works in Mi'kma'ki because of the abundance of maple trees whose leaves all turn red in the fall at the right time during the story. And there's lots of relationships that show these connections, the patterns in the story to the uh, patterns in the landscape, patterns to what the people are doing. I'm sorry, I don't have three hours. Remember, Merdina said, sense of place, emergence and participation, and ideally the natural patterns and the way the humans are telling the stories, the human rendered patterns match towards science understanding, right? Where I grew up, in the fall, it looks like that. And that Mi'kmaq night sky story obviously does not work in the traditional territory of the Blackfoot people. It doesn't work. What were the outcomes from this science program? All right, so what happened? From about 99 to 2005, the program was running well, although there were, there were problems. 11 students got NSERC undergraduate st uh, student research awards. 11 students qualified for those prestigious research awards. From 2006 to 2010, the program started to collapse and it was dead by 2010. A student intake during 99 to 2008 was about 100 to 120 students. Graduates from the program itself, we had 13. Students who started with us or who worked with us as summer research as, uh, assistants, 14 others graduated with a science degree, biology, nursing, public health, things like that. About 15 to 20 of them said after first year science, uh, you know, I think I'm an art student, <laughs> all right? But all of these graduates are working in important and key positions in their communities now. And that is a heartwarming story to a heartbreaking story. <laughs> yeah. In 2008, the program got a national award of recognition from the Canadian Council on Learning. At different times, what was this? If you ask me, was it an educational pathway? I would say, well, at some times it was working as it was intended. It was a four-year science program. Other times it was a facilitated first year of university science. Other times it was a science bridge program for those who had lacked adequate high school science. And at other times it was a couple of first year courses for Bachelor of Arts students. It was combinations, it was all of those. You can imagine the challenge teaching at the first year level. <laughs> so the questions that weren't asked. Something was working. What was working? The university, this is the heartbreak, showed little interest in knowing. The university itself never asked those questions. Something was not working. The university didn't ask those questions. Didn't care if it was working or not working. What a heartbreak. 
No surprise, <laughs> the program died. So you might ask the question, why did this innovative and apparently successful program fall apart? And I, uh, though the university never asked the question, I certainly asked myself a lot, and I put together an opinion piece for university affairs, and I said, look, we had challenges from the outset. We had challenges with respect to administration, faculty, budget, recruitment, more and more and more. Eventually, all of these problems coalesced into politics and just overwhelmed us, all right? But I do think the university, although it never seemed to care, I think it was brave to go down that educational path in the first place, and there are lots of lessons learned. One of the lessons you could ask is, how did the skunk get into the garden in the first place? Because I, I can assure you that we were a skunk in the minds of most of my fellow faculty members at the university. How did that skunk get in here? Well, remember, it was a grassroots initiative. Mm -hmm. And here was the secret. We had a president who was highly supportive, exceedingly insightful, and strong-minded, and took active actions. She resigned in 2002, uh, and then the environment in the garden changed dramatically. And um, anyways, <laughs> as Elder Albert says, this work's not easy. It requires ongoing commitments to co-learning, to relationships, to reciprocities. We need to find ways for our spirits to collaborate. Elder Albert asked artist Gerald to create that image that for Albert shows what he means when he says co-learning. Our spirits have to collaborate. I think Gerald did a great job. Albert asked him to create that image. Right. Our hope is that with lots of seeds being planted that co-learning will continue to grow with many people and in many places. That's our hope. And Albert, Albert and I continue to spread this message all over the place. In conclusion, Albert asked that I say this, we need to relearn our responsibilities to sustain the nurturing wholeness of Mother Earth, of Maui Sugamunawe, her ecological integrity, and we need to enact these responsibilities. We humans, all of us, and the Mi'kmaq word that is all of us inclusive, all of us is ginu. All of us have responsibilities. The other species, our ecological kin, they are the ones who have rights. We humans have responsibilities. Mardina says, in conclusion, we need science researchers, teachers, nurses, doctors, dentists, natural resource managers, science policy makers, et cetera, in and from our indigenous communities. Our young people in these careers helping all of us, you and me and all of us, Ginu, the Mi'kmaq word for inclusive, we, all of us. And those young people need to know who they are as Mi'kmaq young people, who they are and where they came from. We need them, all of us. And my concluding statement is, I wish that all of us, Ginu, all of us, could have science educational opportunities where we emphasize the natural world and our human responsibilities. And we include cultural diversity in those understandings. The different cultures bring different pieces to the jigsaw puzzle. We all have contributions to make. And we need to learn to take responsibility for the way we tell our stories. If we're going to ask that a science review of an environmental uh, project be done, we need to know the Western science can only stay within certain boundaries. The indigenous sciences can take us to different places. We can do things together. I wish we had the opportunity to teach science like that. I really, really do. And once again, I would like to say thank you to many, many people, including the audience here today. Thank you very much.
scratches just the surface of the complexity of human life on this blue planet. We talk about the West and one native culture. There are about 10 to the fourth languages in the world, of which only 10 are, are about are the language of business and communication now. We've lost almost most of all our language diversity. And these problems are so great. I mean, no wonder you walk, walk into some of them the problems. I, I agree with you. Let's return to Elder Mardina's words. Cheryl, we Mi'kmaq people have lived here for thousands of years. Don't you think we've learned something about the fish, the plants, the medicine, the skies, the waters? Isn't that what you teach about in science? If you want more Mi'kmaq students to come to university level sciences, include what we Mi'kmaq people know beside what Western science teaches. That was her vision. All right, and I helped bring that into reality. I agree with you. There are indigenous languages in the thousands. There are languages other than Western science that are taught at universities. I agree with you. It was a very complex, uh, wicked problem that we tackled. We also, in the first year, we had students who graduated with a degree who had no high school science to begin with. We brought them up. We had students who had high school science. They helped each other. They worked collectively. They were all Mi'kmaq students. We had no non-Indigenous students in the program. They were all Mi'kmaq students. The politics were predictable, yes. Yeah. The complexities are overwhelming, but we tried. And we achieved something. And those young people who went through that program, who graduated with the integrative science degree, who graduated with some of the other science degrees, graduated with an arts degree, they are now working in key positions in their communities. And they are bringing a two-eyed seeing approach to what they're doing. And I continue to this day to work with those students to, to support what they're trying to do. So, so I agree with you. I'm not, I'm not at all in disagreement. The politics, the collapse was predictable. Merdina said something to me. She said, Cheryl, from the Mi'kmaq traditional understanding, the following is true. Things come together, they work for a while, then things fall apart. Then things come back together again, and they work for a while, then things fall apart. That's the way it was, Cheryl, with your integrative science program. That's the way it's always been. We Mi'kmaq people know that, and that's the way it's always going to be. Accept it. Suck it up. <laughs> that's what Merdina said. <laughs> well, that's a good question, yes. It's a euphemism for... Uh, Dr. Robinson has asked me to explain what I really meant when I said the university. <laughs> So I said, for example, the university never asked questions. What was working? What was not working? I will not name names, and I really don't want to name positions. But people who are in key positions to make a difference, right? After Dr. Scott resigned in 2002, people in those key positions were many of the original opponents for integrative science. Remember I said it took four years of inquisition? And those key people are now in the positions where they don't want what was proposed some years ago. They can now make decisions that are actually going to. So what you really have to do is, first of all, build a body of yeah. people who yeah. all believe. That's right, yeah. There were. Among my fellow faculty members, there were supporters. Not many in the sciences, but some. Mm -hmm. uh, we learned lots. If I were to start again, there's many things I would do differently. But also, the climate in Canada is different now. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission has come up with its calls to action, including profound calls with respect to education. 
The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples has been adopted by Canada, finally. The climate is different. You also might consider that at, at the time, for the timeline of integrative science, when I said things were starting to fall apart, and yet we uh, received a national award of recognition for what we were doing, there was a change at the federal government level that yanked funding from all sorts of things that were being done in terms of Indigenous education in this country, including the Canadian Council on Learning with the Aboriginal Learning Knowledge Centre. All the funding was yanked out. There's a new climate at the federal level now. It is, and I would like to just mention that when John invited me to give the Robinson Lecture, I said, John, you know, I retired five years ago. And to ask me to tell a story that brings up so much heartbreak is really hard for me. And there's a lot of negative energies that start to visit as a result. And, and so I went into ceremony with Elder Albert and we talked about that. But you didn't retire. Yeah. You didn't retire. <laughs> you didn't retire, you're right. And Elder Albert encouraged me, Cheryl, there's an overall good story there. It's an overall good story. And a, a good story is not a flat line, or you're dead. <laughs> a good story has its ups and downs and lessons learned. That is correct. That is correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Sorry, go, go. Mm -hmm. So my second question is that this is my is taught in Rocky or other universities in Canada or I, I don't know. Sorry, I didn't quite catch the tail end of your so, question there. So that is two, that is two. Uh, in Canada and it's my in university uh, in Rock. Okay, one of, the, one of the TRC calls to action was that the universities uh, begin language programs for the languages for the different nations across Canada. At Cape Breton University, the Mi'kmaq language is taught, yes, but the sacred knowledge that is in, embedded in the, in the language itself, you need to be a fluent speaker in order to understand. So if you just take one course or two courses, you're only skipping the top. You would, you would need to spend years in relationship with elders and knowledge holders and educators from the community before you would be able to understand and speak the language well enough to understand the sacred knowledge. And the language would tell you about your responsibilities such that you then understood why it's sacred and you would not translate it. That is the way it has been explained to me. I do not speak Mi'kmaq, 
but I've worked with elders and knowledge holders and educators who do. Okay, we'll have one or two more questions, but I'm reminded there's a reception waiting outside and you'll have lots of chance to speak with uh, Professor Bartlett. Yes, please. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. It's been a chance before, but it's just good thanks again. And I guess for someone like me who's, who's a very scientific thinker but would like to make you more indigenous knowledge, or I'm looking at my field of research here, what would you recommend first? What should be our first step in indigenous knowledge? Mm -hmm. Your first step has to be developing relations, appropriate relationships with community, with elders, with knowledge holders, with people like Kat. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, thanks again for the talk. I was just um, curious, internationally, I was wondering whether they, if you know of other programs that have done similar approaches or whether there's a development approach that would best work with uh, educational systems in their own way of doing indigenous thinking. I know from my colleague Michelle Hogue, who's at the University of Lethbridge, who works with uh, groups in Australia, that two-eyed seeing is a concept that they understand, embrace, use in their own phrasing. The integrative science academic program is something that they're greatly interested in and are making small steps towards. But we decided to go to a full four-year degree program I'm not aware of any university anywhere that's doing that, and we knew that at the time. But as I indicated at the outset, there are places like Trent University that have an Indigenous Environmental Studies and Science program. And if you're really interested in the details, speak to my colleague Jillian. <laughs> uh, and I know that Michelle Hogue at the University of Lethbridge would love to move her transition program into more than just a year. She'd love to move it into a full degree program. But to the best of my knowledge, what we were trying to do as an integrative science program is still uh, pretty rare. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, before I thank Cheryl, I'd like to thank the people who organized this lecture. First of all, Professor Peter Robinson for making it possible in the first place. But uh, my colleague Judith Poey, uh, who's on the organizing committee, and particularly Michelle Day from the Department of Chemical and Physical Sciences, who did the actual work connected with organizing Cheryl's visit. But uh, most of all, we want to thank Cheryl for coming here. Uh, as I indicated earlier, she's spending her time crisscrossing the country, and now I think to more fertile grounds. Uh, the hope is that she's sowed some seeds here today for knowledge gardening among uh, all of us and certainly among the younger generation. Uh, and um, I think perhaps she was ahead of her time, but my hope is that the time has come. And uh, thank you again for coming here. Uh, we have a little present here. I don't know what's in it <laughs> other than the card. So thank you again, Cheryl. And, thank you, John. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to record this lecture. So uh, any of you, plus uh, all the other people, uh, it was actually my colleague in Victoria who said, can you possibly record <laughs> this so that the whole country can know about it? So uh, a lot more seeds, I think, will be shared thanks to the recording as well. Yes. So uh, you are invited shortly to a reception outside somewhere, but beforehand I'd ask uh, Elder Cat to uh, come back and... Uh, and close this ceremony for us. Um, when I saw the title to this lecture, I, I was reminded of my little boy uh, explaining to me one day when he was about four that to look at things, to understand things fully, he needed to look at them with a different eye other than the ones that were in his head. He needed to have a different understanding of them because that seemed to be the way. And He wasn't sure all the kids did that. And today it reminded me that when I was little, I, I thought this was normal a normal way of looking at things, a normal way of being. I've never known a different way. And I realize there is a one-eyed way of looking at things and that it is uh, uh, in some sense sadly popular, but also gives us a precise angle to look at things. And certainly precise angles are important in astronomy, so I can, I can recognize the importance of science. 
I want to thank you for being here um, because in, in this university, in this setting, you are an elder in, the, in this way and you set a path for so many people to follow. And when we show Makwa Gishka and Dijnaka, Jika and Dodem Kugan, Dunchba Kugan, Nishnabe and Dami Wagashik and Dijnakas, Ame Majado, Jibwabi, Daben, Ganage, Gomi, Nage, Nage, Goba, Miguetra, the Skobini Que, Miwa Manado, Gisus, Manado, Nokmas, Miwa Gitchukumi, Medewa, Bo, Miwi Shagana, Shishubangi. Because the last part means to, in order to share it, I need to speak English here. So what I learn, what I try to transfer, we have to have a common ground to come together on and share. So somewhere between those two eyes is the place we can meet together. And I was thinking about your, your requesting or asking about the languages to be taught. I think there's 600 odd tribes textbook wise in this continent. So you have about 600 languages to learn. <laughs> it's going to take a while. And I appreciate that you touched gently on the idea that you need to spend some time with elders and the traditional knowledge keepers. So um, I quit my day job in 1990-ish and started studying with an elder day in, day out. That's all I did. And it, take, it took until he died. That was, uh, that was almost the old style way of graduating. You take on those responsibilities. So if you can completely quit your day job and spend day in, day out, all day, then you'll get, like I have, a tiny little bit of the knowledge uh, to carry forward. And then I have to pull that from more and more elders. So it's, it's a lifelong commitment. Um, it, it is adopting a way of thinking. And that's very difficult to do because some people like to have a day job or, or feed themselves or do all <laughs> kinds of other stuff. And to bring that into a university setting is really difficult. So you brought a lot in today and, I, and I'm happy that you did because it's opened a lot of eyes. And certainly in order to support this, the politics that we deal with are incredible. There are some awesome people here supporting what we're doing, um, moving forward in the way that we are. And it does take people from, from the high levels, from the higher levels to support what we're doing. Certainly bringing a guest in to speak in this, this lecture series helps a lot. Because now all of a sudden there's a whole room full of people that have a deeper understanding of what we're trying to do. And I thank you for that. I say miigwech, merci chao, just to you. And actually the present in the bag, I know what it is. It's a kitten. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you all. Thank you all so much for coming in and sharing a few moments with us, sharing, opening your heart and listening to and feeling what is being said. There's so much out there. Miigwech. <laughs>